what is important to know about you? So I'm Maike Preising. I'm a psychologist. I'm a neurodiversity coach and a synesthesia artist and a podcast host. I'm hosting the podcast, Let's Talk Synesthesia. It was turning one year old and that's what I do professionally. Uh, besides that, I am German and I'm currently based between Austria and the UK. Uh, and that's all you need to know. Uh, do you yourself have uh, synesthesia and what what types? I do have synesthesia quite a lot. Uh, the first form I ever realized was grapheme color synesthesia. That's where you see letters and or letters and numbers have a color assigned. And that's one I found out already in primary school. My mom found out in primary school because it was the most prominent one. Um, and then we also looked through, like we found stuff about James Warnerton, his uh, taste synesthesia and music synesthesia. And for all the forms, I said, I don't have that. And I think that is because I'm a projector for the grapheme color synesthesia, meaning if I look at a paper, the color is projected on the paper. And I think that was my my reference. That's how intense or that's how projecting it has to be to be synesthesia. But then 20 years later, I realized that there are so many forms that when I hear music in my mind's eye, I see colors and shapes and forms and they're very vivid, very consistent. Um, it's the same for other sensations like smell or touch and pain. So a lot of sensation to... Uh, visuals in all forms and then the other form is ticker type synesthesia uh, when you see subtitles to what you think or say and what other people say so when I hear someone speak in my mind's eye I have like closed captions of what they say um, and then because of the grapheme color synesthesia the words are colorful so there's a lot going on <laughs> I probably have more forms but that's that's my answer. To what extent did it inspire your choice of career? So you've got masters in psychology and you once decided to follow and to study synesthesia. What was the hierarchy here of motivations? So I only found out about the other forms and the relevance for synesthesia for my mental health later in my life. So when I went into university, I moved to Austria in 2014 to study psychology. And I don't remember exactly what my, I wanted to understand the brain. I, I remember that. And at this point, I already had like a school exam or presentation I made about synesthesia but I didn't know much about myself. And what I knew that I was that I had mental health problems, but they never had a name. Um, there was one episode of depression where I was like, okay, maybe I'm too struggling too much to be a therapist at this point. So I thought I'd go into research or to go into sports psychology. Uh, once I recovered from the depression, I uh, applied for a job in Innsbruck and I absolutely loved it. It was social care with uh, mainly schizophrenic patients and it was amazing. And then I realized this is what I love. This is what, I, what I'm good at, working with people, having sessions with clients one-on-one -on -one and having sessions in groups and working in a team. That's what I love. But synesthesia was still not a thing in my career. I was just myself, my struggling self, and professionally, I was just good at what I was doing. And then I moved to the UK, to Edinburgh, which is the, the capital of Scotland. Um, and I was on educational leave. It's where you get paid for doing courses, which was amazing, because that was where all the inspiration finally had more space. And I had a moment to breathe. So I, I started doing synesthesia 
art in the job already. But then once I was on educational leave, I had so much inspiration and room to talk about it. And I was in a new country. So I did more art and my Instagram community grew and we had meetups. And from there, I thought it needs a podcast to share all those stories. And from the podcast, I then realized, well, people actually struggle. And not only do they struggle with their synesthesia, it might be the answer to my struggles. And then I came across neurodiversity, which we never learned in uni. Um, I understood that neurodivergent traits are very under-researched in women, especially, and synesthesia as well. So that's what I focus on now. Adults who are neurodivergent, maybe they have ADHD or autistic and have synesthesia on top. And that's pretty much my experience. So it's very easy <laughs> to, to help others. And now you have this uh, multi-volume podcast, which I was also part of. Thank you very much for inviting me and lots of other interesting people uh, with synesthesia or around synesthesia, researchers, artists. Um, what attracted you to this aspect of synesthesia? Because probably there are many, well, including science or you know, social activism, et cetera. So how did you come to this idea that this voice is needed? That's a good question. I think I had a lot of inspiration to to do it and I saw that there was especially there were young people lacking I hope I can say that <laughs> but in the synesthesia associations are doing such an amazing job um, but of course we have new media we have podcasts we have ways to connect people I didn't really see the young generation being involved yet and I wanted to be involved so bad and thought I can add value to the community. I, I mean, I didn't I didn't know yet, but I saw the potential. Um, and then the podcast was just an amazing thing to connect all those stories, connect this, the research side, connect the people that were involved in synesthesia associations for decades already. And people who, because it's so fresh synesthesia research, you can still interview the people that were there at the very beginning kind of um and I didn't want to miss that chance and then of course just hearing other people speak about their experience is so valuable because once someone describes what they feel or see you can so easily question if that is what you do or not at all and then you get a better feeling for what is actually common what is unique to you what is unique to synesthesia another one or just half of that yeah um, what do you think the general public on the street as we see uh this kind of mass of individualities what can they learn or what can they be taught through exposing to facts about synesthesia Okay. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, as soon as we learn that perception is a thing, as soon as we learn that we perceive the world very, very differently, we get so much more compassion for other people. Once we learn that it's actually the reality we think is reality is still very unique to us. Of course, there are components that are probably most likely true for all of us because we can agree on them there's so much in our brain that we can't um that we never talk about and once we challenge that and by talking about synesthesia we very much do that i think it all it just makes us understand better how different we all are and how normal and okay that is without putting any pathology in the conversation just the fact that some people have hyperphantasia and some have aphantasia i imagine the people that give us hate online for example about talking about synesthesia 
might be more on the aphantasia side of things because when you can't imagine a face or an elephant or a star of course it's very hard to believe that someone when they have pain see colors and moving shapes and then they're very very skeptical but being skeptical skeptical about what i'm telling them might also just teach them something about their own perception and their their own mental imagery their own yeah just perception of the world their brain so, along the same the same line um because you're trying to move synesthesia closer to public to to people uh and this new event that will take place in Innsbruck that yeah it's, it's Innsbruck Austria what is what is it going to be about and what's the idea behind it a lot of what I do is online so uh, when I realized that the podcast is turning one I really wanted to have something in person and I imagine it to be small <laughs> and now it's not that small anymore it's a really exciting event in collaboration with you guys journey through the senses and I'm so stoked for it so the event is celebrating one year of Let's Talk Synesthesia, um, which is still, the podcast is still very small. And I thought about, do I want to keep going? Do I want to stop like all the time throughout that year because it's so much work? But I do know that there's so many people out there that don't know about their own synesthesia. And of course, those are always at the heart. I spoke about the impact on people who don't have synesthesia before. But of course, the main reason is to help people find out about their synesthesia because it helped me so much and it helps my clients and people in the community so much once they understood the impact of the extra information their brain produces and how fatigued they are, how it's entangled, how it holds so much knowledge as well. If you look at emotion to color synesthesia, for example, the emotions are, the colors are telling you something about yourself. And that's such valuable information that's often not even looked at once. So to go back to your question, <laughs> the event will be a place where hopefully a lot of random people from all sorts of background get exposed to neurodiversity. And we're gonna do that by screening the play, The Possibility of Color by Pete Carruthers, who is a English play writer and actor. We're gonna show that in this cozy venue at the local cinema. They have one room that is full of cozy armchairs. It's so nice. Um, and then we're gonna have a panel afterwards which will be me, Pete Carruthers, the actor who wrote the play, and James Wannerton, president of Journey Through the Census and the UK Synesthesia Association. Um, yeah, we're gonna have fun goodie bags as well for the people attending. And yeah, we're just spreading the news about perception is actually very interesting to think about. And it's the base of everything we do. There's a partner, uh, Pete. And Pete is quite new to the community. How come that you are first met and how did it click? I mean, how did this collaboration start? So I met Pete first. He sent me a message after I posted the first couple of episodes of the podcast in one of the synesthesia groups. And then he sent me a message saying, I wrote this play. Here's a secret link to watch it. I would love to hear your opinion. Um, so I watched it and then we had a video call about it and decided to, I decided to invite him to the podcast to, to tell us about it, which was a bit tricky because people, it's not public. So I couldn't just tell people watch it and then we're going to record an analysis with the play writer. So I had a friend, um, read out the summary of the play at the beginning of the episode. And then Pete and I had a conversation about it. Pete doesn't have synesthesia. Um, and the play actually talks about a lot more than just synesthesia. There's uh, this AI 
uh, idea of like a dystopian idea of the healthcare system. What happens if we let AI take over our doctor appointments and have like a Siri voice um, doing our assessments? That's one thing. Um, another thing is voice hearing and then their autistic traits, even though autism is never mentioned, but it does talk about different neurodivergent conditions and synesthesia is one of them. And I found that very clever. I think it's an amazing play and I just like Pete personally a lot. So we just got along very well from the beginning. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say, oh yeah, the other reason why I asked him if we could screen a play is even though I'm doing a lot like publicly, I'm especially on the podcast and on my Instagram, I like you see my face in face talking all the time, but I am actually quite introverted and anxious. <laughs> I don't like public speaking. And the idea of inviting people to an event where I'm the center of the thing, like a live podcast where I just sit there, I know I wouldn't do that well. Um, and I just felt wrong. I wanted neurodiversity to be in the center of the event and I want to be there and I want to organize it, but I don't want 40 people to look at me for an hour. Um, so I wanted to have something really special in the center of the event, which is uh, why I asked Pete if we could show it. How do you yourself relate to the uh, message of the play? Uh, how does it appeal to you? So the synesthesia part, for sure. Um, the autistic traits as well. I'm autistic myself. And even though the traits aren't exactly how I experience the world, um, I just like the representation of our community, of course. The voice hearing aspect, probably more professionally because I'm not a voice hearer myself. But I, I've worked with so many people who have acoustic hallucinations. They hear voices. And even a psychology degree, you know, we don't talk about those fun things like neurodiversity and just the range of perception. We talk about clinical diagnoses. And of course, it's extremely important to understand this voice hearing. Delusion, hallucinations can be an incredibly hard experience. There's no doubt and that's why we put so much time and money into researching um, medication and therapy for people who are, for example, schizophrenic. But then there's the other side of just people hearing voices and their their best friends, they discuss with them, they are good company, they're just there and they don't have to be medicated. They don't have to, um, yeah, they don't have to do anything about it. It's just the way they go about life. like. I hear music and see colors and they hear voices when they, I don't know, have an inner monologue about a topic they want to figure out. And that's something that is not very, uh, it's very stigmatized still, hearing voices. And Hollywood did a big part in this. Like Hollywood representation of voice hearing is always scary. It's, uh, yeah, scary I think is the best word people there's a lot of othering um, and I think that's one aspect that the play does really really well it's bringing us together by just acknowledging that we all have traits in different dimensions we have different profiles of the way we perceive the world how we feel how we go about life and it's not so much about you have a diagnosis you are in the other group now, you're scary. Uh, but other people who have maybe just a bit of anxiety, just a bit of this, you're still with us. You're safe, you're good, you're normal. Um, yeah, so it discusses a lot about that. What is normal and who gets to decide? That's the big question of the play. And as someone who's working in clinical psychology, that's something I, of course, think about a lot. Um, yeah, because we have loads of categories all the time and they're helpful because they give people access to the help they need, the medication they need, the support they need, the language they need to understand it. But it also puts people in boxes and that just needs to be questioned. Yeah, that, that's interesting. So 
Well, my, my, my own question would be, do we need this emphasized diversity? And at what point should we converge and say, no, still there is something kind of uh, common about us? At some turn um, of your life, you decided to offer um, cons counseling, right? So you, you're a, a coaching. Coach. Yeah, it's psychological yeah, you're coaching, coaching. Yeah. Yes. And this psychological coaching that you offer uh, has got a wide range of um, specializations or emphasis uh, or okay, focus, uh, focal points. Uh, what do they come to you for? It's a range of different reasons. So some people just came across synesthesia because of a newspaper article, something on TV, on Instagram. And then they find themselves in this jungle of online resources. And it's not that easy to understand the condition and then the relation to yourself. So some of my clients, uh, they just submit a form and tell me, I just found out I have synesthesia. I want to figure it out. Can can I just have a couple sessions? So we have like three to five sessions, maybe where we just talk about what there's a lot of coaching in, in terms of I give them the terminology and I uh, explain them what they experience and how normal it is. Um, um, and then uh, they, of course, have questions and they look back and I ask them challenging questions to understand where are the lines uh, of their synesthesia. So that's really synesthesia focused, learn about it. I want to figure it out. I want to see what the benefit for my life is when I understand that piece of myself. Then other people uh, discovered that they are neurodivergent. So they have another condition. They're maybe autistic, have ADHD, or they're twice exceptional, which, which would be having a neurodivergence and being gifted. So just those neurocomplex people that probably have been to therapy before, actually, <laughs> and they never felt quite understood to the core. And that's definitely an experience that I share as well. A lot of the things I try to talk about in therapy were never really understood. There is a common misconception that when you have a lot of thoughts, fast thoughts and dreams that you are somewhere in the anxiety spectrum. Whereas for a lot of neurodivergent brains, it's more like very fast firing or just, it's not the right terminology, but your brain is just constantly firing on a couple levels at a time. And your brain feels very, very um, over stimulated but it's not anxiety. You don't have worries. You don't have uh, things you ruminate about. Your brain is just very, very active. And then you often get into anxiety meds or interventions that are made for anxiety and depression. Well, your solutions are very, very different. So there's a lot of, I don't feel quite understood. I don't feel quite the effect of therapy. I want to believe in it, but it only helps me to a certain extent. And the same is for people who have a PTSD diagnosis or complex PTSD. They often get into trauma therapy, which definitely helps to an extent. But there's some parts about synesthesia, like mirror touch synesthesia, where you feel other people's when other people are touched or in pain and you feel it in your own body. Some of the trauma interventions are very much the opposite of what a synesthete can bear. For example, weighted blankets or tapping techniques. They help a good majority of trauma patients, but then for a synesthete or a neurodivergent person, you leave even more stressed, even more st overstimulated. Some told me that they felt like they, they failed therapy. They're, yeah, they, but at the end of the day, it's like, the person who doesn't know about neurodiversity just doesn't speak your language. They just don't get you. And that's okay, but they just don't fully get you because it's very niche. And that's a big part of the clients I see. They just finally 
want to feel like someone is speaking their language and understands them and it's also about just you know a lot of my clients just come with general topics like family dynamics or business goals or big emotions or just things you would talk to a psychologist about but then there's this aspect of they tell me what the emotion look looks like they tell me about any other <clears throat> synesthetic connection and I can pick up on it and bring it back in another session and that's what makes coaching for synesthesia specifically so valuable because it has it sees all of you well that's a big statement it sees more of you <laughs> you seem to be talking about something that you've obviously not seen obviously have uh gone through over overcame or still integrating so something is what is significant and acute to you and suppose i know i always play with my interviewee this mind game suppose you could meet yourself as a child with all the knowledge that you have and uh, you have a kind of a playful session with yourself as a child or a series of sessions doesn't matter just the idea is important <laughs> so what would you do what would you say how could you direct yourself with all the knowledge that you've already acquired about synesthesia and neurodiversity oh i like that question um if i would meet my younger self in a therapy setting or in a coaching setting i think i would have a couple tools there and like noise cancelling headphones, for example, for kids that now exist, which is amazing. And even though I didn't think I was overstimulated, I think I would just offer a couple um, experiments. I think we would just go on the street and I let the kid turn it on and off and just be like, isn't that, isn't that fun? What a difference it makes. And just remember when you're at Legoland next time, which was an awful experience. Um, you can turn them on and off uh, and just see if you need them and look how colorful they are and maybe uh, they're fun for you. And I probably, as a kid, would have said, no, they look stupid. I'm not going to do that. Other people don't do that. But I think it's about making it tangible for myself that oh it does actually it does make a difference um another thing would be to just talk about people in my life and ask them silly things like your dad is orange right and then I would have definitely felt like oh that's uncomfortable why would you say that and would have said a different color and that's the moment I would have realized oh there is a color for my dad so often saying the opposite triggers this, oh, there is an association. Interesting. Um, it's, it's still difficult because I know, oh, it's just difficult because I don't know what would I have been interested in to hear and what would have put me into that stigmatized box because of course I was, brought up in a ableist society like we all are and I had my ableist assumptions and you don't want to be different you want to be the cool kid you want to be interesting you want to be fun and so it would have been probably hard but maybe I would have just gave myself a couple informations about did you know then when you're when things are too loud when you're at a pool it can give you stomach cramps or it can make your knees hurt because that's something that took me 30 years to realize that connections can be so strange. And when nobody ever mentions it, you never even think it's possible. So you go to all the doctors that look at your stomach, that look at your knees and you never make the assumption or the conclusion that it could actually be 
the sound of a loud pool. So I would plant the seed of psychosomatics as wild. <laughs> How do you think uh, kids should be taught about synesthesia and kids with synesthesia? I have the dream of hosting workshops at schools. I think that would be really fun. I would like to just have index cards where you have the different senses and then the different uh, concurrents. So a concurrent is the neurological reaction of your brain to a stimulus. And then I would just like to play around with it and be like, what if we connect the tongue and a sound? What would that mean? So we have the stimulus, sound, and we have the sense, uh, which is taste, tongue. So what could happen if those are connected? Um, and then someone would maybe say that some people can maybe hear a sound and taste it. Um, or the other way around, someone could, what is it, taste something and connect a sound to the taste, which I also met someone before. And that's very interesting because it's not what I experienced. Um, but yeah, I think playing around with just the many different connections is a really good way to get synesthesia in people's heads and in in their idea of how different kids in one classroom experience the world. You mentioned business. Uh, business as somebody's activity and career choice. Uh, and we know that synesthetes are most likely to be up to creativity and, you know, making art, etc. So, But business in other strands uh, that we've mentioned today, like medicine, for instance, there are med medical doctors syne with synesthesia. And overall, mm, as, a, as, a, as a coach, uh, do you think that at some point or for some practices, synesthesia might be beneficial? So I guess the biggest example is Dr. Joel Salinas, who is a medical doctor in the States. He has mirror touch synesthesia, so he feels other people's, um, when other people have pain or when they feel touch, he feels it in their own body. Even when they die, he feels it in his own body, which is a very overwhelming experience if you think about it. But he made it to his career as a, well, he chose the career and then came across mirror touch synesthesia and then um, by studying it and understanding it, uh, he now understands how to make use of it without losing himself, uh, because of course it's very overwhelming at times. Um, but yeah, he can treat a patient, figure out what they are going through, ask the right questions because he has this information and their body's feedback in their own body that gives him extra uh, ideas which someone by looking just at uh, someone's documents and the patient might not notice. So I think that's a huge benefit for the patients, at least that's amazing. Um, I think other professions, that's true. A lot of it, a lot of the synesthetes are in art. They make synesthesia art. So they just paint or animate what they see, which is super cool. Um, Another aspect is therapy for even for me when I have uh, worked with clients who didn't have synesthesia or wasn't at the center of our sessions, me having synesthesia was still very beneficial to the session because, for example, if I think about the person or the mood or the relationship to people, I would see a lot in my mind's eye, like textures and sometimes things are more fluid and sometimes they're very stiff and this is all extra information that you get about like your gut feeling the things that are not accessible to your language yet but by watching it you get extra information about the client and how um, what they make you feel the assumptions you form so that's very very helpful as well um another thing i'm not sure maybe uh you know more about it but I know that some people are into like 
the taste industry, like the wine industry, and because they can see the taste of the wine or coffee, they uh, can be very beneficial to the companies they work at because it's so nuanced. Why should people come and see what's going to happen there in the uh, cinema theater? Uh, and why do you invite people there? Oh, everybody should come. We have limited capacity, but I would like everybody to come. If you are curious about life and people and yourself, this is a fantastic place to learn about multiple topics in a lighthearted way. We all like going to the movies. We like, um, some of us like theater. <laughs> I certainly really like it. Um, it will just be a place to learn about new topics. And it's equally cool if you're a voice hero and you see yourself represented in a play. And it's also really cool if you never thought about it. And maybe you work in psychiatry for the last 20 years and you were still under the assumption that voice hearing is always something to be treated there is something to learn for everybody in this event and if it's not to play it will definitely be the conversations in the lobby and the panel and the dinner after